A very good evening to all of you. My name is Dr. Prince Gupta. I'm the Senior Medical Affairs Manager from Rebron Medical India. On behalf of the ASCLAP Academy and ICA, Indian College of Anesthesia, I welcome you all to the digital dialogue on safety in anesthesia and avoiding medication error. To start with, I would like to thank all the faculties from uh, ICA. So the background and objective of our webinar, the medication error may occur during prescribing, dispensing and administration. Drug administration often carries few risks, especially when not practiced as per protocol. To reduce medication error, smart infusion pumps can be used Smart infusion pump or SIP with drug library is an important solution to reduce medication error. If healthcare facilities incorporate the drug dose error reduction system in their operating procedures. This will also reduce medication costs, length of stay and save hospital bed days. Today's webinar objective is to create an awareness on the importance of medication error in anesthesia and how to improve medication <coughs> safety using infusion pumps for patients. To start with, I would like to thank the panel from the ICA, uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, President of the Indian College of Anesthesia. Thank you, sir. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Mulidhar Kanchi, who's the Dean and Academic Director from Indian College of Anesthesia. And we, today we also have our guest speaker, Dr. Rasya from Malaysia. Moderator, I would like to thank you, ma'am, Dr. Jeshri Sood from Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi, and Dr. Abhijit Paul from AMRI Hospital, Calcutta. And uh, I would really like to thank for this webinar participation, the faculties, uh, one of the most important, Dr. Muldi Chakravarti, Portis Hospital, Bangalore, Dr. Baljeet Singh, SGT Medical College and Hospital from Guru Gaon, and Dr. Varghese from Baptist Hospital, Bangalore. I would like to thank you all the faculties and panel and moderators for your kind participation in today's webinar and digital dialogue. As for the guidelines uh, for this as a housekeeping, note that your microphone is muted throughout the session. Please post your questions only in the Q&A section anytime throughout the session. And the last, the session is recorded. So disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those of the individual faculty and should not be attributed to BBRON, its employees, directors, or any other organization with which the presenter is employed or affiliated. These PowerPoint slides are the intellectual property of the individual faculty and are used by their own consent today. Now to the poll questions, please. I would request all of you to consider these poll questions and answer. Now, I would like to introduce you all to our chairpersons for today. Dr. B. Radhakrishnan is the president of Indian College of Anesthesia. He was an earlier secretary and president of Indian Society of Anesthesia, a working senior consultant 
in anesthesia and professor emeritus in anesthesiology emergency medicine and health management dr radhakrishnan he is currently working in narayana institute of cardiac sciences narayana hridaya bangalore he is the phd from maastricht university netherlands he is a professor of international health university of minnesota usa 1999 onwards and he is also currently the director and of academic and professor and senior consultant in anesthesia and critical care so i would like to introduce dr mulidhar and i would request him to please take care of the meeting of the webinar from now on thank you sir thank you very much uh, dr prince gupta for this kind introduction i am extremely grateful to the uh, indian college of anesthesia as well as b brown for the facility provided to conduct this program and i am absolutely delighted to invite you to the webinar dated 30th june 2021 i am speaking to you from bangalore the indian college of anesthesiology is a brain child of dr manorama mittal and it was established in 2008 and it has taken great strides in the past few years and we have been conducting the webinars every wednesday with or failed since the last last year coming to the subject proper excellent clinical performance is not achieved by the use of sound medical knowledge alone as clinicians we have multi faceted challenges in fact i think that when we work in operating rooms and critical care units we are like working out in gym you don't you have not only to protect yourself but also protect others uh, uh, from injury so that is the crux of the matter you have to safeguard the patient's interest at all times and today we have a galaxy of faculty to deal with this problem and i would like to request uh dr jayashree sood and dr abhijit paul to take over the proceedings of this meeting dr jayashree sood is the chief of uh, anesthesiology at the is gangaram hospital new delhi and she is a well known figure in anesthesia fraternity and her bio data is shown here my she is i mean uh, one of the best academicians and for that for which she has been awarded in 2011 and she has uh, published several papers and is a great teacher i welcome her to this meeting next i would like to introduce dr abhijit paul who is again a bright anesthesiologist his uh, uh, his um, contribution or specialty is quality control and he has been involved in many of the jci inspections and accreditations and he he is absolutely a fit person to be on the chair for this meeting so with this few introductory words i would request dr jayashree sood and dr abhijit paul to take over the proceedings of this meeting dr jayashree sood please thank you very much dr murlidhar uh, good evening everybody so to start off our webinar we have very eminent speakers and the first speaker is dr murli chakravarti he is the director for the past 30 years he's been the director of anesthesia department and the director of clinical affairs at the fortis hospitals he has a very um, highly um, distinguished academic uh, affiliation he is the author of 178 scientific papers nine textbooks and textbook chapters and 19 posters and he is also the editorial member of the red journal annals joacp ija saja and the tja he is also the advisor of the annals of cardiac anesthesia he was the former president of the iacta as well as the former former editor in chief of annals of cardiac anesthesia so he shall be presenting the Uh, so that uh, because he has another meeting to attend uh, dr murli could you please go ahead 
Yeah. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. I hope you can all see my slide. Yes. Yeah. Um, good evening. And um, uh, I thank uh, all the delegates from India and outside the country who joined us. And I think this topic of uh, medication safety cannot be more emphasized than, you know, addressing 800 to 900 people. It's an excellent uh, uh, endeavor by the Indian College of Anesthesia. I thank the organizers for giving me the number one lecture. Adverse, you know, adverse uh, medication routinely occurs. As you uh, know, uh, answered the poll, you would have seen that you would have written yes to all the questions there. There were four of them. I hope everybody answered yes to that because it is so common. I will start with a case report. In brief, <clears throat> the patient underwent unemed full surgery. And they asked for the reversal. The consultant asked for the reversal as the patient had a breathing effort. And they administered the reversal and patient got apneic. Ventilator had to be switched on. On further checking, it was found that atracurium was inadvertently administered instead of neostigmine. This is yet another similar incident, but not in the OT. In the operation theater, you may get away without much problem because the patient is still intubated and you have all the infrastructure to ventilate the patient. Case number two happened in the neurointensive care unit. Patient had bradycardia because of the rise intracranial tension. The neurointensivist wanted to buy some time by giving atropine. As for atropine, the nurse gave a preloaded atropine. Preloaded. Patient got quieter and so quiet that they had to intubate him and put him on ventilator. And things settled. Then they investigated the preloaded atropine was indeed atracurium. And the case three, this was an infant on arterial switch operation done. Continuing to be pulmonary hypertensive, normally after a switch operation, we expect the children to settle down quickly. In inhaled nitric oxide did not help. Paralysis and sedation did not help. Syringe pump driving noradrenaline appeared to be malfunctioning. We changed the syringe pump, things settled. And what did the lesson learn? That we had to calibrate the syringe pump at regular intervals. We were lucky to suspect a syringe pump malfunction and change it. Many times you will not even know. So with this introduction, I am sure these case scenarios appear familiar to many of you. I am sure you have had uh, no bad experience while treating them. Luckily, the patients saved. But I am sure there are a few unfortunate ones who are nodding that a patient had to pay a heavy price. And sometimes the hospital and the anesthesiologist also pay a heavy price in the court of law. You must know that on an average, anesthesiologist loads about 15 agents. And you must remember intravenous fluids, gases, inhalational anesthetic agents, antibiotics, they are all drugs. If you add them all, you add about 25 drugs or more, more drugs if there is an event. If there is a hypotension, you may use a vasopressor. If there is bradycardia, you use atropine. So the number of drugs increases. Considering the short time lead that one gets in anesthesia, anesthesiologists tend to mix agents in one syringe. Many of you will be mixing fentanyl and atracurium, propofol, etc., saying that nothing happens. How do you know? All drugs are not compatible with each other. And if you look at the manufacturer's uh, recommendation, they will say, do not mix this with any other drug. <clears throat> so globally, globally, it is not in India or in Asia. Globally, anesthesiologists use one syringe used for one drug for another drug. It is not shortage of syringes. It is not saving money, but a bad habit. OK? And look-alike, sound-alike drugs are not uncommon. OK? When you say adrenaline and noradrenaline, Somebody may not hear the word nor. At least there it is okay because they are similar quality drugs. But atropine and atracurium, you know what can happen. So there can be a compromise of safety. Medication errors reported. The word reported is important here because many of the time, 
the errors are not reported. Okay, these are the causes of death in the US. You can see these two, cancer and heart disease are number one and two, but medication error is number three. And you all will agree with me that medication errors can be completely be preventable. And how much? We have 251,000 medication errors, which is equivalent of 10 jumbo jets crashing every week. Just imagine if aircraft industry had been crashing like that, we would have got rid of the aircraft industry and gone around on bicycles to various places. But why are we tolerating medication errors? Because it is done by us. We are creating it. <clears throat> And there is another important thing, Dr. Paul, for example, our chairperson, I know him for many years. He has completely switched over to quality in anesthesia. It's a rare subspeciality. And usually there is no designated personnel. <clears throat> I have a sub, you know, quality in our department. We have a dedicated person who monitors it. It is very important to monitor the outcome data. I'm not going to you know, produce that famous uh, cheese hole theory picture where if there is an accident that is happening or adverse event happening, all the error prone points align. You know, the drug name was not heard, drug was not written well, the person loading was not, you know, seeing properly, it was night time, there was no light, all these align and then the drug error happens. Therefore, every error is considered as a process failure. That you know, the time when you consider the drug error as an error of an anesthesiologist, it's not a quality parameter at all. When you consider it as a process failure and create a fishbone, I'm going to show you a fishbone. It's a, one of the quality tools that is used. And most importantly, culture of safety should be encouraged and you encourage people to report errors. If they don't report error, you will not know. No data, no problem. Therefore, please encourage your colleagues to report the error. This is the, you know, this is the FMEA is a failure mechanism effective analysis where you analyze what was the initial problem, what caused this. So I wish I could show you in detail, but there's no much time. But I'm sure you should ask your quality department to create a, a fishbone diagram against a medication error. This was an error that we noticed in our ICU, I told you. So what did we do? We did not punish the nurse or the doctor. I don't even know who it was. But what we are doing is we are doing a timeout when you're administering high alert medication. The nurse who is giving atracurium will say, I am giving atracurium. Somebody has to say, yes, please go ahead. If nobody answers, she will go on repeating till somebody answers her and confirms the action is right. And also, we have now put an additional red band around the syringes, around, uh, you know, in, you see this, there's a red band. You can make out from a distance that the syringe contains a neurovascular blocking agent. <clears throat> and these are the lookalike, sound alike uh, medications. And unfortunately, some of the medications are named even same, not similar, same. So I was told that there are medications called misolam, which is for midazolam and also for some other drugs. So we have to be extremely careful. And whenever you go for an accreditation, the first thing they will ask you is, what is your process for controlling lookalike sound alike medication? You have to make sure that the person administering actually looks at the empty ampule if it is loaded. And you know, this is the prob probability of errors. That overall probability of making at least one error in IV therapy is 0.73. Medical errors, I told you, are the third cause of death. 10 to 20% of autopsy studies uncover major diagnostic discrepancies. Of course, diagnostic and medication errors are different, but it could happen. <clears throat> there is an Indian study which said, ask the questions, have you ever experienced drug error in an anesthesia practice? They said seven, it's not seven, 70 percent. <laughs> I think it was 75 percent. Has any of your plans major morbidity? Yes. When you experience more, you know, more incidents per day, 
21 in the daytime, 27 in the nighttime. Why are incidents not reported? Because of fear of medical legal issues, unwillingness, fear of judgment by colleagues. <laughs> there was one more study by Runciman. I'm sure the seniors in the audience will know who Runciman is. Runciman did not study catastrophes. He studies near misses. He said near misses give you more information than catastrophes. Catastrophe, it's already happened. Near misses missed it. So you have more data, more information. So you can see that by making some interventions to doctors, they made sure that that is intense education, reduce the fear of reporting, range of reporting options, enhanced feedback, then improvement was noted. So it has been shown that you must report, you must analyze and make a process change. And we know that international patient safety goals have been advised by JCI, which is even approved by <coughs> WHO. The third of that is the safety of medication. There are only five of them. And one of that is safety in medication administration. So you know how important it is. And of course, medication error types, I'm sure the other speakers are going to speak. <coughs> speak. <coughs> Sorry. Other, <coughs> other speakers are going to speak about this. And this is the medication error even in our own ICU. <coughs> You can see the data is collected routinely. All the ICUs have reported. It may be zero, but still report. <laughs> what are the factors associated with this? Lack of therapeutic training, inadequate drug knowledge, inadequate knowledge of the patient, inadequate perception of the risk, overworking and fatigue. Many times at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., the errors happen. And the physical emotional issues, poor communication. I think all these are being covered today also. And I'm sure you are going to listen to the expert speakers who are going to say that. There are some patient characteristics also. Patient personality, complexity of the clinical case, sometimes even race. You know that in Asia, we rarely see <coughs> Uh, adverse reaction to uh, you know rocuronium, but it's very common in the Europe, especially the Balkan countries, Norway and Sweden. They have anaphylactic shock. We rarely see them. <clears throat> the work environment also can lead to problems, workload and time pressures, distractions, and lack of standardized protocol, and insufficient resource. Only one person is anesthetizing, no help. It can happen, poor lighting, night time, power failure, all these can affect. Medicines, naming of the medicines, sometimes the label, you put a short form. What short form you use may not be understood by another person. So you have to standardize these things. And you have to have a repetitive system of ordering, processing, authorization, and also patient monitoring. Factors associated with computer infra information system. Sometimes when you are ordering on the computer, instead of five milligram, 50 milligram may be ordered. So be very careful with that. What are the mitigation methods? Standardize the drug dilution in the hospital. The entire hospital should use the infusion in the standardized way. Always time out when you are using a high alert medication. Never let a drip run through. If you open a drip, Occluder, stand with the drip. You cannot allow a drip to run through. Label the syringes, make it color coded. Never reuse syringes. And patient control analgesia is a good method because there is no human intervention. And do not mix drugs as far as possible. Encourage the culture of reporting and do a root cause analysis of the problem and improve the process. Do not be punitive, look at process correction. Please remember, if something can go wrong, it will. This is the famous Murphy's Law. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. 
thank you very much dr murli for that excellent lecture and uh, there is no going it's absolutely so important to have heard this topic on the importance of medication safety uh, i don't see uh, dr abhijit would you like to see the question and answers i don't see any yes ma'am there, there is not yeah. a question but there is a remark which is remark has uh, rajiv question right. He yes. writes that in Australia, all neuromuscular agents are delivered in red syringe. Uh, right. I think that was exactly what Doctor uh, was just mentioning just now. That uh, we do label all the high alert medication uh, in in red labels, and all local anesthetics are are placed in a separate tray with IV drugs. All vasoconstrictor drugs are and agents are marked with black felt pens. So, would you like to uh, comment on this? Uh, I think it's an excellent idea that what uh, comment that was uh, shown by Rajiv Kishan. I, I think we should also look at uh, encouraging our uh, uh, syringe manufacturers to make uh, red colored syringes for the neuromuscular blocking agent. You know how difficult it is to get some things like that. But getting a red label is very easy. I, I appeal to all of you to start ordering red labels and start sticking them on or you know, in the neuromuscular blocking agent label itself, the top and the bottom can have a red strip. That's all. But having a red syringe is an excellent idea. I agree with you, Dr. Paul, about you know segregating the syringes. Yeah, you basically have the protocol for your own department. Like you are, of course, in charge of all the Fortis hospitals. But yeah. uh, maybe like ours is one hospital. We have the same protocol. Yes, ma'am. Any other a, question? Yeah, there's yeah. a question on uh, neuromuscular nerve stimulator, train of four, before reversal. I think most of us uh, may be using it also. <clears throat> and, uh, then there's a thing of IV fluid are given in collapsible bags rather than plastic bags. I think that's the standard practice in most of the uh, centers now. So, um, how to decide when should a perpetrator of an error should be punished? This should lead to, lead to... Yeah, it's an important question. An important question because uh, there are some habitual uh, uh, offenders, if I can say. Uh, what happens is they can repeatedly make similar errors. As per the healthcare policy, you cannot be punitive. You have to look at improving the processes. But if somebody has decided to take this opportunity to harm others, that should be taken up at the administrative level and that should become a part of his service records. And during the appraisal, he must be informed and he must be encouraged to move away from the high-risk area and go into research and other areas if he cannot concentrate on safety. Safety is top priority. Exactly. That is, in fact, one of the standards of the JCI. Right. Uh, this is seem to be the only question and answers. Am I right, Abhiji, Dr. Abhiji? Yes, ma'am, I think. No uh, more, right. Thank you so much, Dr. Murli. Thank you, that madam. Thank really you, madam. Excellent thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the opportunity. Thank you. So many points to take home. Thank you. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I take the uh, privilege and the honor to welcome the next speaker, who's Dr. K. Vargi Zakaria, who happens to be the head of the Department for Anesthesiology at the Bangalore Baptist Hospital, which is also a tertiary care center accredited by the National Board for Teaching and Guiding Postgraduate Students. Uh, Dr. Varghese uh, has been uh, an MBBS from the Government Medical College, Jabalpur, and he has done his MD from CMC, Bellore, where he was also a faculty for around four years before taking up an assignment with the Mubarak Al-Kabir Hospital in Kuwait for a few years uh, prior to this current, uh, uh, current responsibility. He has presented at various national and state conferences and has multiple papers in journals, including Lancet and Indian Journal of Anesthesia. I invite you, Doctor, for your presentation on communication in a crisis, which is a very important topic of today. Over to you, Dr. Varghese. Thank you, Dr. Abhijit. I, I thank uh, the Indian College of Anesthetists and B. Brown and giving me the opportunity to talk on communication. Uh, Baptist Hospital has been associated with communication for a quite long time. So 
when Dr. Murali asked me that uh, you are the person to speak, because I was feeling very honored. So what uh, in safety, communication between the team members, because most of the places in anesthesia and intensive care, we are working as a team. So the communication between the team members is a very important aspect, which can lead to improved clinical care of the patient. I'll just start my talk with a case scenario, which uh, probably a lot of people would have seen. Let's say in a busy OPD, all the doctors are sitting and seeing the patients, a 40 year old suddenly collapses in the OPD. And you have a horde of people rushing in to find out what is happening. It's in the hospital, a code blue is announced. Five doctors appear and one starts doing chest compressions. Other four starts talking to each other on what is the next step to do. So while this conversation is happening, one person completely doing just uh, compressions, it happens for almost 20 minutes and uh, status after 20 minutes of attempted CPR, the patient could not be revived. So what went wrong? If you look at it, group action without a coordination doesn't lead to a res result. There was no team leader no effective communication between the members who were doing the resuscitation. So what I will be talking is poor team dynamics and there was a lack of job allotment to each of the members. Successful resuscitation attempts often uh, require healthcare providers to simultaneously perform a variety of interventions. These cannot be performed by one person or cannot be the in the thought of one person, we have to plan and allocate the work to different people. My talk is actually based on ACLS guidelines, but it can be extrapolated to what we experience in the theater and in intensive care or in any parts of the hospital. Effective team dynamics, I was talking about team dynamics, give a better chance of survival. So what I was talking, the roles to each individual has to be clearly explained. And one of the most important thing, another important thing during a resuscitation or during a crisis is how to communicate and what all to communicate. What I was talking, effective teamwork divides the tasks among the various team members and helps in multiplying the chances of the successful outcome. So the team, the team is made up of people who are expert expert in medical and resuscitation techniques. And that communication between these members of the team is very important to help up a team dynamics. So a team consists of a team leader and the team members. So what is the role of the team leader? So role is he organizes the group. This is all happens before a catastrophe strikes. More, organizes the group, assigns in the, each work to each individual so that they don't have any confusion on what to be done in case of a catastrophe. Monitors individual performance and backs the team. Understanding between the team members is a very important aspect in communication. He's also responsible for training and coaching it. And models excellent team behavior, focuses on comprehensive patient care. Now, what has the role, what is the role of the team member? He should be clear about what his role is and he should be well practiced in what he's supposed to do. The resuscitation skills or a treatment or whatever happens, which causes a catastrophe, what he's supposed to do, he has to be well practiced. In an emergency, the algorithms, the drills has to be well practiced in his mind and the team members should be committed to success. There are unclear roles. What uh, there are some signs of his unclear roles is when the organization or the team has not practiced properly. Each team member doesn't know what has to be done. So this is like examples are redoing the same task again and again. So he continues uh, doing, for example, in a code blue arrest, the same person continues doing the chest compression. You can have fatigue. So you, you need a change of arms. This is for an example, essential tasks can be missed. An IV line which is connected can be out of the venous axis. 
So you actually may not be having a good IV line. Multiple rules by the same person is not a very good technique. Individual members has to be assigned individual uh, roles, which has to be played in the part of a catastrophe. All what I talked just now leads to effective high performance dynamics. Finally, it leads to a satisfactory and a good outcome in a crisis. Something which I would always ask my team members here is know your limitations. There is no problem, no ego being hurt in calling for help early. Uh, I, I, I have called my juniors to help me out in certain procedures when I, am no, I know that I'm not able to do it. I, the ego should not be there. This is all a part of important communication between the team members in a time of crisis. One more thing I would uh, like to add is, in an emergency, no unfamiliar skill should be practiced. It all should be the usual rhythm, the drill and the algorithm, which has been practiced over and over again, which has to be done. Then only that the time factor is considered the resuscitation effects or the management of the catastrophe happens quickly because time is an essential factor in our profession. We can have some constructive interventions which can be happen either during the procedure or can be talked to later on. Inappropriate action needs to be corrected, but it should not be criticized in such a way that the member feels guilty or the member feels bad. It's very important to make sure that the talk in construction or in, in improving the technique should be tactful. A debriefing after the catastrophe always helps. And when we talk each to each other after the catastrophe, there will be some things which should have gone wrong that can be pointed out and make sure that these things don't happen later on. Always avoid confrontation. Now about communication. What is actually communicated? What is happening in communication? It is a sharing of knowledge. A person doing helping out in a catastrophe may not remember to do something else. So a knowledge sharing by somebody else is very valuable for team performance. There is something called fixation error. What is fixation error? This is like you, you think everything is okay. There is no new thing to be added on. Or this is the only way which can be, it, it can be done. There is nothing like that. You can always try something else which has been suggested. Patient's condition which is there Everybody in the team who is helping to work on the catastrophe or on the management of the patient should be shared. The, what status, what physical state of the patient is, has to be known by everybody. It is not only the sole right of one person to know about the patient. That is why you have more brains thinking on what to be done. If you want, after the procedure, always summarize and reevaluate. A patient status and interventions done. What are the findings during the assessments? You can always change treatment plans as the patient's condition improves or deteriorates. The frequency of monitoring of the patient, it, uh, what we usually do in anesthesia, I always tell my postgraduates, the initial first minutes when the patient, you start on anesthesia, it has to be, you monitor it continuously, but documentation has to be five minutes. But later on, you can continue the documentation as 10 minutes. But if the patient's condition worsens, then you have to increase the frequency of monitoring. That 10 minutes comes back to one minute. And you have, if you have uh, beat to beat monitoring for a sick patient, that is how it helps. Communication, what I am actually talking about is, is very important. Like how uh, Dr. Murli Chakravarti has also told there is always somebody who closes, somebody who tells that, okay, I'm going to give a tracurium, or somebody listens to it and then tells that he's going to give a tracurium. What we tell is this is called closed loop communication. If it's a team leader or a team member who tells, it has to a uh, very loud, concise communication. The speech has to be very distinctive. It should not be mumbling. People should, everybody in, in the hall or in the place, whom the, where the catastrophe is being managed has to hear it 
and it has to be clear. The tone of voice should not be harsh. It should be a controlled tone of voice. Example, can you give atracurium uh, 10 milligram or 25 milligram? You as a team leader is telling the team member who is supposed to give the IV drugs tells back, I am giving 25 milligram atracurium. This is the loop is getting closed. So you have less chances of mistakes happening and you make sure that your communication helps in completing the treatment strategy for the patient. Sorry, my screen, screen got struck. Yeah. Uh, managing the ego of team members is a very important aspect which has to be taken care of. You should make sure that no ego is hurt. Uh, friendly control tone of voice is very important, as I told previously. So the best team which is formed and to help out catastrophes is you have respect for each other, work together in a collegial and supportive manner, and they have excellent communication in between, between them. Always acknowledge correctly completed assignments like thanks, well done and all. And with this, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vergis, for your excellent lecture. And uh, of course, uh, we see these things, the uh, communication skills and in our uh, daily routine. And we'll be taking the question and answers at the end of all the lectures. Uh, may I introduce our third speaker? Thank you, Dr. Abji. So our third speaker is Dr. Baljeet Singh. Dr. Baljeet Singh will be taking the third lecture. He is at present at Gurugram, the head of anesthesiology at the SGT Medical College. And for several years, he was the director professor in the GB Pant Hospital. And besides these two uh, positions, he's also the CEO of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists and a very good friend of ours. Today, he shall be talking on adverse drug events. Thank you very much, Baljeet. Could you please start your lecture? Thank you so much, Madam, for your kind words. The, the topic, what is printed there, is slightly different than what I was initially uh, asked to go ahead with. So I'm speaking on adverse drug events in anesthesia and critical care. Uh, let's look at anesthesia. It's, it's a kind of a success story. Why is this coming again? Yeah, December 7, 1941. Pearl Harbor, I think most of the seniors are uh, quite familiar with that uh, incident. A lot of casualties. The dictum at that time was finger on pulse, eyes on the chest, observation of skin color. And then there was a recently launched drug, Tavapantone, and that's what was used for uh, treating the patients. NSA related death rate at that time was one in 450, which is a very, very high, almost unacceptable, uh, you know, uh, Great. Came September 1980, the operating surgeon calmly notes, his blood, uh, notes that the blood is dark. The anesthetist checks, finds circuit disconnect. No oxygen analyzer at that time, no disconnect alarm, no pulse oximeter, no automatic blood pressure monitor. There were manual blood pressure cuffs, ECG machines, which could not be uh, employed uh, you know, the patient because of the bulky size. No monitor other than the five senses of the anesthesiologist. And anesthesia death rate at that time was around one in 10,000. End of 20th century scenario. Cyanosis is virtually never seen by trainees and death by disconnect is now almost unheard of. We have very good monitors, gas analyzers, pulse oximetry, anti carbon dioxide, NIBP monitors, anesthesia workstation, and many more devices are part of the modern anesthesia work toolbox of the anesthesiologist. And the death rate in healthy patients is about 
one in 200,000 to 300,000, remarkable progress indeed. Anesthesiology has demonstrated leadership in patient safety and anesthesia related mortality has decreased considerably over the years. But do we gloat over the success story that we have decreased in mortality? I think there is some time for us to think about uh, this again. Then came uh, a kind of a shocker of a report by the Institute of Medicine, where they reported that the patients get harmed during treatment in the hospital. Death from disease is one thing. I mean, death from disease may occur, but death from hospital error cannot be acceptable. And this actually was the genesis of the WHO surgical safety checklist and also the WHO patient safety initiative. Now, harm does occur in hospital and uh, you know, we are quite familiar with investigations uh, into patient harm during hospital admission, inadvertent medication errors and adverse drug events. The scope of the problem is that for every 100 hospital admissions, 6.5 patients experience an adverse drug event. And for every 100 medication errors that occur, approximately 1% harm the patient. And five serious medication, uh, medication errors occur for every 10,000 medications that are administered. Uh, in the lifetime of an anesthesiologist, see, uh, injecting one drug at one time is one thing. And an anesthesiologist normally in his lifetime injects about half a million drugs. And you can understand, half a million times and to be 100% right, well, uh, that's asking for uh, rather too much. And as Dr. Murli uh, also mentioned that error in ordering are much more likely to be intercepted uh, than those at the administration stage. Now, what is the adverse drug event? WHO defines an adverse drug event as an untoward occurrence, including undesirable signs and symptoms or accident leading to reduction of dose, discontinuation or intervention during treatment with a pharmaceutical product in a patient or a human volunteer that does not necessarily have a relationship with the treatment given, a long definition. And this includes ADE, adverse drug events from medication errors as well, which I will not touch because Dr. Murli has done a great job with that. Medication errors occur at any stage during ordering to administration. This also was uh, mentioned by Dr. Uh, Dr. Murli. And some adverse drug events are harmless, near misses or may cause injury to the patient. Injury resulting from medical use of a drug includes medication error and adverse drug reactions. And medication errors is an injury resulting from an error in preparing, procuring, prescribing, dispensing, administering, or monitoring. And adverse drug reaction is an injury resulting from the medical use of a drug where no error is involved. Drugs have beneficial effects, we all know. Effects uh, and the drugs save a life uh, and they improve health, yes. But what's important here is that drugs have harmful effects and they also threaten life as well. What is a drug, adverse drug reaction? It's a response to a drug which is noxious and unintended and which occurs at doses normally used for prophylaxis, diagnosis or therapy of a disease or for modification of a physiological function. That's the definition which is given by WHO. For approved pharmaceutical product, a noxious and unintended response at doses which are normally used uh, in humans and for an unregistered or a new drug, a noxious or unintended response at any dose of the drug. What is the difference between adverse drug event and adverse drug reaction. Adverse drug event does not imply causality as to what is the cause. It, adverse drug, uh, ADR is a, there a causal role is suspected in, in adverse drug reaction. Then there are serious adverse drug events. An adverse drug event that is associated with death, persistent or significant disability or incapacity, prolonged hospitalization, congenital anomaly or birth defect, or otherwise life-threatening for the patient. Now, uh, adverse drug events, adverse drug reactions and medication errors are sometimes interlinked and all the three are grouped in one uh, heading that is medication misadventure. So that's the new terminology that we have. Now, uh, are adverse drug reactions a problem? Yes, they are a common clean a clinical problem, they lead to adverse consequences and from mere inconvenience to death, 
and they have a very high incidence of clinical, uh, very high incidence in clinical practice as well. What are the consequences of adverse drug reactions? They adversely affect patients' quality of life, complicate drug therapy. They decrease compliance and delay cure, increase cost of patient care, and cause patients to lose confidence in their doctors, may mimic disease, resulting in unnecessary investigation and delay in treatment as well. The onset of uh, action of, uh, of the adverse drug reaction uh, may be acute. Uh, that's within 60 minutes. It may be subacute, one uh, to 24 hours, and later, more than two days later after the target administration. It, uh, the severity of the event may be mild. It doesn't require an antidote, therapy, or prolongation of hospitalization, or a moderate, which requires a change in, but not necessarily cessation of the drug, and may prolong hospitalization or require uh, special treatment as well. It may be severe, which, which can be life-threatening, requiring discontinuation of the drug and specific treatment of the adverse drug reaction, or it may be lethal, where there is directly or indirectly uh, there is contribution to the death of the patient. There are various types of uh, adverse drug reactions. Type A, that is augmented, it is predictable, and the response is qualitatively normal, but the quantitatively, it is abnormal. It's common uh, in about 80% of the incidences there. It's less serious, dose-related, and can be tracked by dose adjustment. It includes simple side effects, toxic effects, or the withdrawal symptoms from the uh, patient. Uh, type A is of two types. It can be extension of primary effect or augmentation of the therapeutic action, just like uh, you know you, you experience bradycardial propranolol due to the effect on beta-1 blocking agents, or the secondary effect this action is different from the drug's therapeutic action. And the example is just like bronchospasm that you have propron law that is due to the effect on undesirable beta-2 blocking effect. For propron law, bradycardia is a primary pharmacological adverse effect. And bronchospasm is a secondary pharmacological adverse effect. Type B is somewhat bizarre. It's not predictable, uncommon, but maybe serious. And because of the patient peculiarities, it can be easily uh, reversed and not always preventable also. It may be idiosyncrasy, drug allergy, anaphylaxis, or hypersensitivity as well. Then there can be idiosyncratic reactions, inherent qualitative abnormal response to a drug due to genetic abnormality, mainly due to the deficiency of enzymes in the body. The incidence, it happens in a very small population. It can, it's rare, but very, very serious. Idiosyncrasy can be due to enzyme abnormality like hemolysis uh, with primaquine that's due to G6PD deficiency. And uh, idiosyncrasy may be due to receptor abnormality like malignant hypothermia with general NSF that we uh, get. Then there can be drug allergy, also known as hypersensitive reaction due to antigen antibody interactions. Uh, example, penicillin, you know, uh, that's very well known. There are various other types of uh, ADRs, uh, the types of allergic reaction, type 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, for want of time, I will not go into those. Coming to type C or the continuous type of adverse drug reaction, uh, this, these happen due to long-term chronic use of a drug and involves dose accumulation as well. Example is analgesic nephropathy with paracetamol or NSAIDs. Type D is a delayed effect. Uh, EDRs are found in long term after use. There can be teratogenesis, uh, teratogenesis or carcinogenesis. And teratogenesis, I think uh, some, one of the most important drugs, which is very well known to everyone, is thalidomide. And this is what the thalidomide babies look like. This was the drug which was given to patients uh, who were pregnant and during the period of organogenesis. That's from uh, from six uh, week onwards to uh, to about uh, uh, about 24 to uh, 24 to uh, 26 weeks. So uh, the babies were born without arms or flipper-like uh, limbs. Types of ADR, other teratogenic drugs, there are various uh, kinds of uh, other drugs, vitamin A, antithyroid drugs, steroid preparations, uh, oral anticoagulants. Also, in general, all drugs should be avoided in the first trimester of pregnancy. Then there is type T error, uh, type E, uh, that's the ending the drug use. Uh, ADRs are manifested after withdrawal of a drug which was used for a long period of time, just like uh, glucocorticoids when they are abruptly withdrawn or discontinued after prolonged use, you know, uh, the patient goes into uh, glucocorticoid crisis. 
Then there can be phototoxic effects. Drug accumulates in the skin, absorbs light, photochemical reaction occurs. There is tissue damage, erythema, uh, edema, blistering, etc. And tetracycline is the drug which is responsible for that. Photoallergic here, the, uh, you know, there is cell-mediated immune response, contact dermatitis on exposure to sunlight, sulfonamides, and busophilbin are the common examples. Then there can be dependence, psychological and physical dependence with withdrawal symptoms in case the drug is withdrawn after a long period of time, carcinogenics, uh, carcinogenicity and mutagenicity and with the anti-cancer drugs and estrogens and drug-induced atrogenic diseases also like salicylates cause peptic ulcer and phenothiazine cause Parkinsonism or, and INS causes uh, hepatitis. Who are most at risk from ADR uh, adverse drug reactions? Patients who are very young or very old or are females are taking multiple uh, drug uh, drugs for various uh, ailments. 50% of patients are on five drugs or more. They have more than one medical problem and have a history of allergy or previous reaction to drugs. When do you suspect that patient has uh, ADR? A symptom that appears soon after a new drug is started, appears after dosage uh, is increased, disappears when the drug is stopped, and reappears when the drug is restarted. So that's when you should suspect that ADR is there. What questions should be asked if, if you suspect an ADR? Does a patient have a history of other drug-induced problems? Does a patient take more than one drug? Could an interaction be causing the ADRs? Long-term medication uh, is unlikely to cause new problems all of a sudden. What else should require? When did the reaction or symptoms begin? Have any uh, of the clinical measurements or lab results recently become abnormal? Does the patient have any medical problems? Uh, then prevention of ADRs. Whenever a drug is given, a risk is taken. A risk may be avoidable or unavoidable. So you have to weigh the risk uh, with regard to giving the treatment to the patient or giving the drug to the patient and withholding the drug with regard to the patient's disease. Now, 30 to 50% ADRs are preventable, uh, you know, and, and as far as possible. Uh, whenever there is an inappropriate medication or unnecessary medication, we increase the possibility of ADR occurring in that patient. Reduction of ADRs can be achieved by better knowledge of diseases, better knowledge of drugs, site-specific delivery, informed, careful, and responsible prescribing. Management, mild ADRs are often uh, recognized before they become serious and if an ADR occurs, the type and precipitating factors must be determined immediately if possible. Discontinuous offending agent, if it can be safely stopped, the event is life-threatening or intolerable and there is a reasonable alternative available for the management of that patient. Uh, discontinue non-essential medication, administer appropriate treatment, provide support or palliative care and consider desensitization of uh, the patient. Generally, for dose-related ADRs, modify the dose or reduce precipitating factors. And for ADRs unrelated to dose, the drugs usually should be withdrawn or avoid to and, and avoid re-exposure to that. Monitoring adverse reactions, yes, they should be monitored. Detecting adverse reaction, once you have it, there should be documentation of the ADR and they should be reporting uh, you know, all serious ADRs to the pharmacovigilance centers and assessing causality between the drug and the suspected reaction. Uh, every medical college has a pharmacovigilance committee and you know they report to the national center that is based somewhere in Gaziabad and the international center is based in Sweden. So this is a kind of form on the right hand side uh, where the worst drug reaction needs to be reported to the government so that they can have a data and establish which are the drugs which are more likely to have it. Well, friends, uh, you would agree with me, uh, anesthesiology is not a child's game. I'm uh, coming to the end of my presentation. Uh, we have had uh, progress over the last 175 years. Uh, earlier, we used to have these kind of devices on the left-hand side where we had masks and, you know, very, very inadequate kind of equipment. We call it inadequate now because now we have much advanced uh, NRCA workstations, much better equipment that we are working with, much better monitors, unlike uh, the previous times. We have moved a lot from 1846 when Morton first time gave anesthesia and the modern day OTs, you can see there's a kind of safety uh, measures which are, uh, you know, which are observed just for the interest of the patient safety so that there's no harm that occurs to the patient while he is with us. And the journey continues and it will continue till every patient going for any kind of anesthesia does not suffer from any harm and we can assure him of complete safety when he comes out of the operating room. Thank you very much for your patient here.
Thank you, Dr. Baljit, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, while we are still, the, well, the evening is still young on our side of the Indian Ocean. Right. It's around 10.30 in the, in, in, in the night for those who are in Malaysia. Our next speaker of today is Dr. Ravintrinan Rasia from Petalang Jaya, Malaysia. His current position is he's a consultant in anesthesiology and critical care specialist at Avasina Specialist Hospital and Avasina Women's and Children's Specialist Hospital, Saha Alam. He has been the past president of Malaysian Society of Anesthesiologists and also the Malaysian College of Anesthesiology. He had completed his MBBS from Kasuba Medical College, Manipal, India, and did his master's in anesthesia from University of Malaya. He holds fellowship in Academy of Medicine from both Malaysia as well as Singapore. His areas of interest are obstetric anesthesia, orthopedic anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, total intravenous anesthesia, and critical care. He would be speaking on safety and infusion of drugs, reduction of medication error using smart pumps with advanced technology solutions. Over to you, Dr. Ravi. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And good evening to uh, everybody. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Indian College of Anesthesiology and the B. Brown of India uh, for inviting me to speak on this uh, topic today. Okay, I've got a problem trying to move my slide. All right, the topic of today is safety and infusion of drugs with reduction of medication errors using smart pumps and advanced technology status. Uh, I do not have any relevant financial relationship with the commercial interest to disclose. I'll be talking first about smart pumps, drug libraries, and then I'll go on to safety. The World Health Organization makes patient safety a health priority. The World Health Organization estimates that there is a one in three million risk of dying while traveling by an airplane. But in contrast, the risk of dying due to a preventable medical accident while receiving health care is estimated to be one in 300. In fact, as many as one in every 10 patients is harmed while receiving hospital care in high income countries. Industries such as aviation and nuclear medicine have a much better safety record than healthcare does. WHO estimates there's 1.134 million adverse events which occur annually in the low to middle income countries due to unsafe medical care. And this contributes to 2.6 million deaths annually. As I already mentioned, a medication error is defined as any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in the control of the healthcare professional, patient or consumer. And this is also what the National Coordinating Council for Medication Error Reporting and Prevention in Malaysia. So in over here in Malaysia, we have what is called as a MERS uh, system where it is under the Ministry of Health of Malaysia, where every medication error has to be re reported. And it's an online reporting, which is done by any, any healthcare personnel can report. And the reporter is kept anonymous. So data is collected from these reports and new SOPs and policies are derived from these reports. Now, the old pumps, they all have old technology, which has got very limited safeguards compared to today's pumps. The clinician with the old pumps, the clinicians it has to do the manual programming for the IV drips infusions. They have to like count 
the dr number of drops, which is equal to so many ml and how many drops per minute has to be done. So it's all manual. Errors can be made at this point. The customized medication concentrations and infusions leading to a large variability. So there's different concentrations are prepared, different rates of infusions are given by different doctors. There were a lot of types and models of IV pumps and accessories throughout the organization. Years ago, different companies with different pumps, the disposables for these pumps were custom made for that pump. So if you buy a pump from a company A, you had to use the disposables from company A only. Otherwise, you cannot use the pump. But today's pumps has got various models incorporated. They've got different kinds of disposable syringes. The parameters are all already in the pumps. So you just have to select what uh, syringe I'm going to use or what giving set I'm going to use, and you just click on it. So it has made more of an open door policy for these pumps. Those days, reporting on medication errors relied slowly on the direct observation and was self-reporting. Today, there are various ways of reporting. Even a non-healthcare uh, personnel who observes a medical error can do the reporting. And all names and patients' names and uh, are kept as a anonymous, so there's no uh, injury to these people. If you look at this, in just take a sample of, from Rebron, over the last 60 to 70 years, if you can notice, is from 1970 when they came up with the Infuso Med till 2004, how the technology has changed so much, and we have now got the space pumps available. And this has even developed further into a lot of new sub smart pumps where you have pumps which can do a turn, uh, takeover modes and various TCI modes, etc. So this is just from one company. A lot of the other companies have come in later parts, but they have all come up to about the standards where we are now today. What are smart pumps? These are computerized patient infusion devices that include features for administration error prevention and data collection. And it represents a transformational clinical tool that can greatly decrease the rate of IV medication errors in hospitals. This technology provides medication error reduction capabilities via a program dose limit alerts with an audio and visual feedback to staff regarding illness orders, improper dose calculations, and or programming errors. Smart infusion pumps have been introduced to prevent medication error. The risk of medication errors with infusion pumps is very well established. 22% of events involved a high alert medication a majority of wrong rate errors led to medication being infused at a faster rate than intended. And the most common cause or contributing factor to this was the user programming the pump. So before a, a user can start using a pump, the user has to be credentialed and privileged to use those pumps. They have to be trained to use these pumps. Give you an example here is I know of a nurse who came to this hospital. She was new, although she had about five years working experience at another hospital. When she came to the new hospital, she was put in charge of the intensive care unit where the pumps was new to her. And she just programmed a pump for a drug the wrong way, thinking it's the same as what she did with the old pump, the other pump. So, all pumps has to go under user programming to make sure that they know about the limits of this pump, what it can do, what it cannot do, and what are the alarms for. Infusion pumps are essential for administrating fluids, 
nutrients and medication intravenously to patients. However, the use of infusion pumps is also associated with a high frequency of adverse events. What are the negative effects? Compliance rates of using smart pumps is slower. People tend not to use the smart pumps or they try to take shortcuts when using smart pumps, like overriding the soft alerts of the pumps, not intercepting when there is errors. When the alarm goes off, they do not intercept to see why there was an alarm. Rather, they switch off the alarm and continue with their work or the possibility of using the wrong drug library. Later to the end of the lecture, I will show you some examples of this. Smart pumps reduce medication errors, but they do not eliminate programming errors. Programming errors are still a human factor. You need to key in the data into the pump, like the patient's height, weight, age, sex, etc has to be keyed into the pump before you can operate the pump. Although the hard limits of a drug library plays a main role in intercepting medication errors, the soft limits are still not as effective as the hard limits because the soft limits of the pump can be override. So there's a high incidence of this override. According to the FDA, any medical device manufacturer is required to submit a pre-market notification if they intend to introduce a device into commercial distribution for the first time or reintroduce a device that will be significantly changed or modified to the extent that its safety or effectiveness could have been affected. I come to some terminologies. What is a serious event? It's defined as an event, occurrence, or situation involving the clinical care of a patient in a medical facility that results in death or compromises the patient's safety. And this will result in an unanticipated injury requiring the delivery of additional healthcare services to the patient. An incident is an event or an occurrence or a situation involving the clinical care of a patient in a medical facility, which could have injured the patient, but did not either cause an unanticipated injury or requires the delivery of additional healthcare service to the patient. High alert medications, as you all know, they are drugs that bear a heightened risk of causing significant patient harm. Now, what is a drug library? A lot of these smart pumps have got drug libraries incorporated into them. So creating a drug library for a smart pump is done by a multidisciplinary team involving professionals from different hospital departments, from the hospital pharmacy to the different departments where the pumps will be used. So you might have a smart pump it might be used in the intensive care, or the patient then goes to the operating theater, it moves to the operating theater, it can then move back to the normal ward, but different people will be using the same smart pump. So when you buy a smart pump and you put in this drug library, you need the help from these various department staff to give you what needs to be put in the drug library what concentration of the drugs need to be put into the library. So each department has to define the drug, where they are the most used or the most sensitive that they want to be included into the infusion pump library. The pharmacies has to be involved in this. So the protocol really put into these pumps in one hospital may differ from the protocol in another hospital. It depends on what drugs are being used, which level the hospital is going to be. Is it used in the general ward? Is it used in the intensive care, critical care, or in the OR? So the concentrations, the dosage, or rates, these drug libraries are never the same in any of the two hospitals. So all these drug libraries must be designed 
according to the needs of each hospital. Medication error has already been mentioned. They have a serious implication to both the patient and the healthcare system. And this may also compromise the safety of the patient, which in turn will significantly impact the healthcare cost. I'm going down to what are the factors contributing to a medication error with a smart pump. The first error is programming. The, it is defined as an entering an incorrect setting of value into an infusion pump interface. The provider may have entered the incorrect information for a range of region, uh, reasons, such as he miscalculated the pump. Like when the on-call nurse came into the ward, she noticed that the PCA pump uh, was set at a different rate, where the basal rate was put at 0.6 milligrams per hour and the running rate was at 0.3 milligrams per hour. But what was ordered was the other way around. The PCA rate was 0.3 milligrams and the basal rate was 0.6 milligrams. So this uh, error scan take place. Sometimes is the number of digits, whether it's 0 0.2 or 0 0.02 is very important. Uh, one decimal point change can change the rate of infusion. You are sometimes enter a value into the rate field when it is intended for the volume to be infused field. So it's a field swap programming. So these are all human errors. Fail to choose the correct medication in the drug library. Sometimes instead of using, say, Amedron, uh, 600 milligrams per 100 ml, you have KDNS, 900 milligrams per 100 ml. You might have entered the drug information into an incorrect pump channel, which is called a pump channel swap. Or after entering everything, you fail to start the pump. Error number two is a pre-administration process problem. This is an incorrect order, incorrect transcription or preparation of the order. So the medication order may have had incorrect or conflicting rate or dose information. For example, a patient, nurse noticed that the patient's dosing weight for heparin infusion was listed as 58 kilograms, but the order was written by the doctor for 64 kilograms, and the pump was set for 64 kilogram. But the nurse contacted the physician and informed the physician and the heparin rate was decreased to match the appropriate dosing of 58 milligrams. Tubings and connections. The failure to connect or clamp IV tubings. The user may have erroneously administered medication as a gravity flow instead of via the pump or connected that IV tubing tubing to an incorrect access port. The most common mistake is instead of connecting to the IV line, the administrator, the user connects it to the arterial line. Or my connect the tubing meant for another medication into the wrong bag. Or fail to close or open the tubing clamp. Malfunction. All these are electronic pumps which can malfunction. In spite of you put in the correct program, the correct setup, the tube, the valve, everything, the pump did not function properly. So this is a malfunctional pump. You should discard this pump and take a new pump. Maintenance of the pump. All these pumps have a manufacturer's uh, code when is the preventive maintenance due for these pumps. And the maintenance must be Maintain the pumps has to be maintained at those appropriate times. Yes, usually when you buy a pump, they will give you a free uh, part uh, maintenance service for two years or three years. But after that time, you still need to enter a into a contract with the manufacturers to come and service these pumps. Otherwise, you're going to end up with the pump not serving properly. 
patient behavior. Sometimes you might set the pump to run, say, an IV infusion, supposed to be running at 100 minutes per hour. But either the patient or the grandchildren who come around, oh, see, this is a toy. Let's play with these buttons here and press on this button. And next minute, say, a setting for 100 ml has now become 700 ml. And when the nurse comes and sees the pump, hey, why is it running so fast? Or why is the infusion finished so fast? And then the patient says, oh, yes, my grandchildren were playing with the pump. They must have. So anytime, especially when the pumps are in the general wards, you must have a locking mechanism for the pump. So anybody presses on the buttons, uh, the settings are not changed. Or especially nowadays with the touch screen, again, there must be a method to lock this screen so that no error is done. Can smart pumps fail? Yes, like I mentioned, software problems. The alarm levels can show inadequate errors. Broken components, battery might fail. Sparks, shocks, short circuits can take place. Do smart pumps reduce medication errors? Despite the widespread use of smart pumps, intravenous medication errors have not been fully eliminated. There are still medication errors from smart pumps, but the number of medication errors have decreased over the years. So one of the benefits of using smart pumps is intercepting errors such as the wrong rate, the wrong dose, or pump setting errors. Other benefits include reduction of adverse drug event rates, practice improvements, and cost effectiveness. There must be compliance in using smart pump. This is the key towards effectively preventing errors. All right, on this paper, which benefits and risks of using smart pumps to reduce medication error rates by Kimishko Shi he the, the literature suggests that in conclusion, smart pumps reduce, but they do not eliminate programming errors. And there are opportunities for improvement include upgrading drug libraries, developing standardized drug libraries, decreasing the number of unnecessary warnings, and developing a stronger approaches to minimize walkarounds. Also, as other clinical information system, smart pumps should be implemented with the idea of using continuous quality improvement, quality of improvement process to literally improve their use. What are the safety strategies? Ensure appropriate setup, maintenance, and integration of smart pumps. Modern infusion pumps incorporate numerous design features that are intended to prevent various types of use errors. Like for example, many models have infusion pumps today now include the capability of uploading a drug library with preset limits specific to each drug. So this technology can help to prevent, help prevent the wrong dose, the wrong rate, and various other setting errors. Apply a multidisciplinary approach when evaluating a procuring infusion pump. Like I said, uh, you need to have the various departments, the staff nurses, the pharmacies, all to evaluate and then procure an infusion pump. Given the implications of patient safety and costs associated with a large procurement of infusion pumps, I cannot stress it more. It is important that all relevant parties are involved in the decision-making process, all right? The pumps might have been brought in for trial to be used by staff nurses, the end users, to evaluate these pumps before you procure the, procure the pumps. Develop a process of regularly collecting safety-related data, but this data collecting it is not sufficient. You need to review this data, create the solutions to address these pump-related concerns. And once you create these solutions, you need to implement 
these solutions. Despite recent advances in infusion pump technology, hospitals continue to experience medication errors while using infusion pumps. So like I said earlier, the data which you collect, you need to come up with new SOPs to correct any errors to reduce the number of medication errors. There are many potential solutions to mitigating risk of medication errors with infusion pumps. Health personnel should carefully consider all possible solutions, which will range from acquiring better design pumps to adjusting settings on the pumps or developing a robust error reporting and training program to address the use errors. In an effort to mitigate risks of safety-related events, personal healthcare facilities have to foster a strong culture of event reporting, including near-miss events. A just culture should be uh, developed. It is not finding fault, it is to for patient safety as such. With, the, with that information, a safety program can proactively be identified, problems, identify problems and subsequently develop the solutions. Targeted and prompt remedial actions, such as training and enforcing existing standard operating procedures to reduce medication errors should be implemented. Another paper from the Joint Commission of Journal of Quality and Patient Safety, they, optimizing smart infusion plant safety with those error reducing system comes to the conclusion that smart pump technology resulted in improving the medication safety, preventing patient harm, faster recognition, and response to alarming pumps, and further promoting a culture of safety. Another paper on the impact of implementing smart infusion plant so what was the objective of this paper by Erika Paraxis was to reduce the length of patient stay in ICU, bed occupy time versus ratio of the patient, and as such to reduce the cost of treatment due to medication error in the intensive care unit. And the final conclusion was the use of smart palm technology has shown to be very profitable in the intensive care unit because it avoids costs from prevented medication errors and allows for savings on disposables and medications by establishing a standardized concentration and dosing units. So it is having these smart pumps is so much cost effective. Yes, the initial layout is higher, but the ROI is very good. Now the following slides are photographs and there's a video. It is no not one particular pump, it's just for educational purpose. I took a photos of some of the pumps which are in our hospital where it is just basically for teaching purpose. So when you're on the pump, a new therapy, it comes up like this, use a drug library. So you have to answer yes. So you have to use a drug library. What is the category of drugs you want to say? Whether you want all the drugs, go through the list of all the drugs in the drug library, or you want to zoom in on the specific, like whether you want to use antiarrhythmics or fluids or et cetera. Now, this is an example where there is two, in the drug library, there's two concentration. An amiodron concentration of 600 milligrams per 100 ml, or an amiodron concentration of 900 milligrams per 100 ml. You shouldn't have too many of the same drug different, too many dilutions, not having like 300 milligrams, 50 ml, 600 milligrams, 100 ml, it's too many, you might have. So this is the loading dose and this would be the maintenance dose. So you got two doses. So the user must know about what's in the drug library, what are the concentrations, and what the concentrations are meant for. So this is what I say is, the user must be credentialed and privileged to use these pumps. The short video here. Oh, can't get the video. Yeah. This is where 
My one message is just loading a palm. This was just videoed for educational purpose. So the order was to use a TCI of remifentanil at a dose of 0 0.075 nanograms per mil. So mom comes out, she says, use the drug library. She scrolls down to go for TCI. So she clicks on TCI. She goes on remifentanil. Right, she's supposed to use a 50 mics per mil. That's the dilution, but she keyed in the 20 mics. All right, if you notice, she's keying the height of the patient, sex of the patient, the weight of the patient, the age, next year, age of the patient. So you see, it's actually an adult patient she's keying in for but she has got the concentration wrong. And she, the target was 0 0.075. Now, some pumps have only got a two de a de uh, decimal point. Some have got three. So she see, she cannot go to 0 0.7, 0 0.075. So she thinks, oh, it's a mistake. So it should be 0 0.75. So she keys in as 0 0.75. So this is, the dosage is more than what was prescribed. It's 10 times more, and this can cause harm to the patient. So although the uh, drug library is there, but the programmer keyed in the wrong dilution as well as the dosage. So you have to be careful on this. The same thing she, we tried with another Strange. Now the same dosage, everything, but basically here, instead of 0 0.075, she keyed in as 7.5. So again, there is another error. So the take home message is, always return to the basics of six rights of medication administration. The right drug, the right dose, the right route, the right time, the right patient. And the most important thing is the right documentation in the notes. Documentation, I cannot stress more. It is very, very important. You might do something today by, like in Malaysia, by law, the patient can come back to sue you six years down the line. That's a liability period for a patient. If it's with a maternity and a child, it goes up to the age of 21 in Malaysia. The law allows the child to sue you till the age of 21. So if you don't have this documentation, if I ask you, this patient you did six years ago, and this is the dosage of the drug you gave, or this was what you wrote, you cannot remember if you have not written anything in the notes. So this is where lawyers catch on to this. Nothing is there in the notes. You cannot be defended. It is really, really, you've got no legs to stand on. And if the patient tells you it is a wrong medication or wrong treatment, especially to the paramedics, the nurses. The doctors might have explained to the patient a certain things. The patient knows. Patients are very well educated these days. They know. They know when it's the wrong medication or treatment. Please stop and check the order. If you're not sure, please talk to the doctors or the seniors again. That's all I have now. Please stay safe, everyone. And thank you very much for listening to me for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Winston, uh, for such an essential and important topic that not only the students, but the faculty should also know. Although the many hospitals are not fortunate enough to have smart pumps, however, it has to 
uh, they should know about it because they might be going to tertiary hospitals or abroad where these smart pumps are being used. Thank you so much. And we now take the questions and uh, queries from the audience. Uh, Doctor, would you like to start on it? Yeah, one of the questions which has come uh, was, uh, if not colored syringes, at least colored needles can be used. I think uh, this was directed towards the first speaker, Dr. Murli Chakravarti, but since he's not there, we can actually take this uh, question. Thing is, uh, most of the needles are anyway color coded as per the gauge of the needles. So uh, having color coded needle for high risk medication may not be a solution because in India and with different makes of the needle manufacturers, we do have needles which are hypodermic needles connected to the syringes and they have their color coding as per their gauge and not per as per the drug safety. Uh, having uh, color coded syringes could be, uh, could be a good thing to have. Uh, I feel that would be the answer if, if there is something else to be told on this, ma'am, you feel you could also elaborate on this? Uh, do we need any uh, comments from the speakers for this? Yeah, there was a, there was a question that uh, why not have colored coded needles? Yeah, that's right. I agree. You know, whatever you may do, colored coded needles or color coded, but it is basically as we told Dr. Uh, as Dr. Murli said, the protocol should be set in the hospital whatever you decide for your hospital, for your department, it should be practiced. And there should be nobody who is, uh, you know, not following the orders. This is what I feel. And of course, we have so many things. We had so several companies giving us the color coded labels. So you may do anything, the labels or the needles or the syringes, but whatever you do, you have to have the same protocol and everybody has to follow it. Is that right, Abhijit? Yes, true. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's a question. It just tells that yeah. simulation training is the best way to teach, learn, and improve communication in general and crisis communication in particular. Would you like to say something on this, Dr. Vargis? Because I think our our uh, the uh, mega codes of ACLS, uh, you know, can be better done also through simulation labs, which we have. Many centers have simulations on this. Can you just unmute yourself? Oh, sorry, I was uh, muted. Yeah, I was telling that even my talk was based on the ACLS protocol, but it can be extrapolated to everywhere. So simulation labs definitely help in smoothening out the hitches and all in the uh, communication and algorithm workup and all those. So it, simulation labs and mock drills are an essential part of communication management and even the algorithm management. Actually, I agree with Dr. Varghese. Uh, you need, you can do a lot of simulations in the lab. You can do it teaching in the classroom, everything. The mock drills really help. It really helps to show what everybody needs to do when there is like a code blue. When they come down to the ED or something with the code blue, what every person needs to do. And it, with today's COVID-19, again, there's a lot of restrictions. How many personnel should be there? How many personnel should be only exposed to the COVID patient? So all this, you need drills. And you need to do a lot of drills, keep doing it over and over. In fact, the other day, what I did was I did a drill for a COVID-19, as a COVID-19 drill patient. We did one in the daytime. And then I went back to the hospital at 12.30 in the morning and we did another drill in a different part of the hospital, in the cafeteria of the hospital, we did the drill. And we could see there, although everybody knows what to do, but when it came to the live uh, show, people forget, hey, I'm supposed to do this, uh, this is what needs to be done. So I think we need to do a lot of drills so that everybody, all the staff knows what to expect what to do when they come in for these code blues. So communication is very, very important. Then there is another, uh, I don't know, it's a comment. 
uh, it's written that comment in telephone orders of two nurses must listen to doctor's orders. I think it's a, it's about the telephonic order, like verbal orders. Yes. When a, when a doctor gives a verbal over over the phone on, say, a high alert medication, uh, should it again be followed by two nurses? I think it's a, it's the same thing that whenever we are administering a drug, it should always, a high alert medication, I think it should be always checked by uh, two nursing staff or one nurse and a doctor who can be a junior doctor before administering the drug. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same principle. I mean, especially in the intensive care, you know, a late night, the doctor, the nurse might call the doctor at home and the doctor will say, I give, say, I will uh, frusamide uh, 20 mg and two nurses have to listen to it. And the nurse has to repeat the order back to the doctor to make sure that she heard it correctly with the right dosage. And when the doctor comes into the hospital, that order needs to be documented in the notes. The doctor has to document it. So it's a legal documentation there. Yeah. Then uh, what about color code labels by ASTM? There is American Society for Testing of Materials. They have separate color codings. I think each hospitals in India, and, uh, they have their own uh, color coding, but then more or less, most of the high alert medications are coded as red. And uh, that's what uh, most of the uh, national uh, kind of guidelines do. But then ASTM standard, I'm not very sure if anybody of any one of you have any idea on this color coding of ASTM can always elaborate on this. We don't have, but uh, what we do is the muscle relaxants have a red label on it and the opiates have a blue label on it. So both are dangerous medications, but at least you know that the one with the blue label, it's an opioid. Okay. I don't know what the ASTM standards. Yeah. Uh, Rajiv Kishan, he writes in Australia, about 80% of the cases are done using Tiva propofol, remifentanil using smart pump. Since 2004, volatile anesthesia is used in the remaining 20% of the cases. India must prepare for this transformation. I think we are also using the same thing in most of the uh, good centers and tertiary centers. Ma'am would like to take this question. Very true. Yeah, uh, Abhijit, you're absolutely right. The tertiary care centers have started using this, although not the other hospitals. It will come into, the, into practice, of course, later on after maybe 10, 15, 10 years or so. However, we have to be very careful in this while we are doing this agreed, we will be using the smart pumps, etc. Uh, in this, but the other things have not to be forgotten that the this monitoring has to be there. So everything is there besides that, of course, the drugs have to deliver the normal, you know, they, they should be no errors while we're delivering these to the smart pumps. But in that we have to, so Tiva is a very specialized technique. And in fact, we've been practicing Tiva in uh, some uh, OTs for a very long time, although we have not completely switched over to it, but uh, that's how it is, right, Amiji? Yes, ma'am. Um, there is one anonymous attendee who writes, does somebody of the speaker have evidence that a smart pump with drug library, including soft and hard limits, reduce the medication error in their wards or hospital? Dr. Ravi would like to take that? Like I said, uh, even we have the hard limits, the soft limits, the smart pumps, it is not 100%. Uh, uh, there's no more 100%, uh, no more medication errors. Medication errors still can take place, especially most of the medication errors. If you looked at our MERS and we analyzed that, uh, these medication errors with the smart pumps, most of the errors is due to. The first most important one was compliance of the using of the smart pumps. The user was not compliant in using the pumps. They override the soft limits. They take shortcuts. The second one was the medication error still occurs due to pump failure. So these were the two most common errors, the programming, the compliance, and pump failure. So we are still... The pumps are being developed uh, much and much better. Uh, like two years ago, when we started our new blog, we got new pumps for them. And now two years down the line, the 
same company has come up with a new version of palms, which is better than the old version. So the companies are developing from these feedbacks, from the especially the MERS feedbacks, they are developing more safer pumps, but still medication error can take place due to the human factor. Unless we have robots now programming all instead of doctors. Um, can we ask something to the to the B Brown people or to Dr. Ravi from our end, from the moderator's end, if that is okay? Yeah. Yeah, we wanted to know whether, uh, see, uh, from critical care perspective, uh, we are using what is called as cue sites on the on the three ways. Uh, yeah. So, because most of these three way stop cocks have been done with because of the infection control guidelines, they uh, always advocate cue sites. Uh, when we use the uh, smart pumps, does it have any any issues with the uh, overcoming of the resistance of the cue site? when we are delivering a drug dose or is it the same what we can use for a three way? Like the, when we program the pump because the Q sites have to overcome a certain amount yeah. of resistance uh, yes. at the hub. So that's why the, the pressure limits on the pumps, uh, when you buy the pump, that's why when I say the procuring of pumps, a multidisciplinary approach has to be done. Now, depends on what is your practice. Now, I agree with you, Dr. Paul, that uh, three-way taps are uh, uh, not to be used because of infection rates in the critical care. You should have everything, a dedicated line going through. Or sometimes what we have like for the TCI pumps, we have one, you can use one channel to go through, but uh, from the syringe, there's two tubings coming and it, it all comes in a, and joins together finally as one. So, we can have those kind of tubings to overcome that. But when you buy the pumps, if you're using three-way stop cocks as such, the pressure limit of pumps have to be adjusted when they're bought. The manufacturers have to adjust the pressure limits to overcome the resistance of the three-way stop cocks. Then nowadays we have the one-way valves connected onto the IV line. So that if you go through the literature, when you connect uh, this one-way valves onto an IV line, already your flow rate is decreased and the resistance is higher. So the pumps, uh, the pressure limit has to be raised so that uh, they will overcome this uh, pressure resistance. If that is not said, what is going to happen is the pump is going to keep on alarming and alarming and you get alarm fatigue and the nurses will just go and press silence, silence, silence. And you're not going to get the correct dosage going to the patient. So it's very important that pressure limit must be adjusted on the pump to overcome this uh, resistance in the drug delivery system. You know, one more thing I just wanted to ask. I'm sorry. This thing is, uh, can we use the smart pump for enteral and parenteral nutrition? Because to ensure uh, that a certain amount of calories and protein has been given every hourly so yeah. in the post-operative setting or in the critical care, can we use yeah. that for... The enteral and parenteral feeding also. Yes, you. I mean, it's you can use the smart pumps, the infusion pump, where there is you can like a drug library. There is for nutrition, whether you're going to give uh, parenteral nutrition or or, or nasogastric nutrition, uh, you can program the pump accordingly. The latest pumps have that feature available. Or like for nasogastric pumps uh, feeding, you can use the kangaroo pumps or the uh, NG tube feedings. But for IVTPN, the latest versions of the smart pumps, they have got something called for nutrition under the fluids. So you can go into the nutrition and key in what you are giving, what kind of uh, TPN you're giving, whether you're giving company A, company B, it's all there. And so you can program that accordingly to give the uh, TPN via the infusion pump. The string, uh, infusion pump, sorry. Yeah. There is a question which says that global eyeballing rate before starting infusion helps, for example, a remifentanil rate is between 5 to 30 mils per hour. A rate like 100 mils per hour must warn us of error. Uh, yeah. So you see, we use uh, like. TCI, remifentanil, and 
proper fall, when you're running into a smart pump, you don't go on to what is the rate you want to run it. I want to run it three mils or five mils. You need to go to the uh, dosage. You want to run at one nanogram per mil, or you want to run at two nanograms. So effect side target, you need to key in those parameters. Then the flow rate will be going. So on the pump, you can also see, I've keyed in say for three nanograms per mil, and I will know also what is the ML going, how many mils is going per hour through the string, I mean, the delivery. Of course, you look at it, okay, it's supposed to give only five mils per hour for that dosage, and you're running at 50 mils per hour. It's either something, it's a malfunctioning of the pump or some software problem with the pump. You should immediately discard the pump, send it back to the manufacturer to recalibrate and use a different pump. So that, these are some of the errors which can still happen. Like what I mentioned, the software errors can still happen. So that's a very important way you have to maintain the preventive maintenance regularly according to the manufacturer's setting. Like I've got a few of the smart pumps uh, for the delivery of TCI pumps where now the background light is no longer functioning. There are people I know still use that because they don't want to change because it costs a lot of money to change the background light. So they have light. So it's still very dark and they try to do which is wrong. As soon as something is wrong with the pump, you need to send it back. You need to spend the money to repair it and use it again. It is just like your handphone. When your handphone is not working, you throw away that handphone and you go and buy a new handphone. So the same thing should apply. You can do it for yourself for having a new handphone, but for the hospital, you don't want to save a patient's health by applying the same principle. So it's very important. One more question to Dr. Ravi. What percentage of cases in Malaysia has been done under TIVA propofol and TIVA ramifentanil? Um, in my hospital, uh, the two hospitals together, almost 95% of the cases are done under, 95% uh, of the general anesthesia cases are done under TIVA, TCI. 5% is still, even pediatrics, we're now doing it under TIVA, TCI. Nationwide, uh, after, ever since we held the World Congress of uh, TIVA in 2018, uh, the rate of using TIVA has increased tremendously. So especially in the public hospitals, the limiting factor right now is the availability of pumps in, for every operating theater in the public hospitals. Private hospitals, most of private hospitals has invested into these pumps to deliver TIVA to the patients because the outcome is so much better. One question, Ravindra. Yeah. Well, when you practice TIVA with the machinery or with the proper hold, do you put the patient on LMA or on endotracheal standard intubation techniques? Uh, we use both, depending on the case. Uh, we used LMA or we can use endotracheal tube also. Uh, like my dental cases, which I do, I don't use relaxant at all. I take the patients deep with the TIVA with a bit high dose remifentanil, and I intubate the patients with the remifentanil on board. Once I've intubated, then I cut them down and I don't use relaxant. So the same thing we apply for, like we are doing uh, a breast slum excision, then we would use a, a laryngeal mask and just go purely on TIVA. So in short, you may protect the airway with an LMA or with an individual tube and then yes. practice your TIVA. Yes. Yeah. But uh, say a case with under spinal, we still use propofol in a TIVA mode, TCI mode, but in a very low dose, just for sedation. Like how we use TIVA now for our upper scopes and lower scopes. With a small dose, low dose uh, TIVA, we use uh, propofol remy for our lower scopes. And upper scopes, we just use with TIVA, TCI, low dose for the upper OGDS scopes. Could under separate, yeah, under separate what is the reason why you had to put on TIVA? You can easily get the work done with sedation. With them. Yes, um, because um, yeah. the rules in Malaysia is changing uh, where the operator 
who is doing the procedure cannot give the sedation like what it used to be. The surgeon gives the, its own sedation and does the uh, scopes. But now the regulation does not allow that, where the person giving the sedation must be trained in ACLS and must be of a certain standard to provide the sedation. So when they call in the anesthetist to do that, we find it much easier. We just straight away use a TCR propofol for the sedation. So patient wakes up so much clearer, they go off to back home much, much earlier. So the bed occupancy rate becomes less. It's the, same, it's the same protocol followed anywhere else in the world? And uh, some of the other hospitals have started doing that. So it's actually a learning process. So you have to trial and error and you learn how to titrate accordingly to do the upper and lower scopes with this uh, technique. You simply have very tough laws. Yes, because uh, of practice. Yes, uh, Dr. Yes. Radhakrishnan, there are some uh, institutions, tertiary care centers in uh, India as well, who where the gastroenterologists desire propofol instead of uh, this thing, uh, sedation. So it's coming in India as well. Actually, ma'am, we yes. actually do our scopies with uh, uh, fentanyl bolus and uh, Propofol sedation on That's a right. uh, infusion yeah. pump. Most Very of the true. fine surgeries where SSCP and MEP monitoring are being done. Yeah. Is oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But they were talking yeah. about the scopies. They were mm. talking about the scopies. So there also yeah. it's becoming popular. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Fine surgery, definitely. Scopy, yeah. I agree. Personally speaking, yeah. scopy, I agree. But how mm. far the service of anesthetics is dispensed? In that particular situation. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Radhakrishnan, this can only be done in the tertiary care hospitals. But no, yeah. very difficult otherwise. <laughs> but I think what's happening is patient safety standards are worldwide. Yeah. People are going yes. more and more towards yes. patient yes. safety. Yes. Yes. At the end of the day is, uh, if I'm going for an upper scope, I would definitely want somebody else to be giving the sedation. I don't want yeah. the surgeon even the sedation is doing the scope and he doesn't know what's happening with the saturation yeah. and mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. so, Here also, hmm. being done under sedation, whether who gives the sedation, that matters. Yeah. Whereas Ravindran was telling, it is a qualified anesthesiologist who gives the sedation in most of the developed countries. Whereas we may have to wait for that particular change to come out. We may have to wait for some more years. Yes, it is. Yes. I mean, uh, here it is moving in that direction. Yes, it's going absolutely. in that direction. It's moving in that direction. It's not, it's not a law as such, but yeah. what the law states is the person giving the sedation must be a qualified doctor and must have been trained in their advanced cardiac life support and must be also trained in giving mild to moderate sedation. If going into deep sedation, must be given by an anesthesiologist. Absolutely. So, even, even in our country, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Radhakrishnan, I can vouch for that, at least in Delhi. I know the corporate hospitals and our hospital as well. The anesthesiologist has to be present at the time when these procedures are being done. Absolutely. Well, that's good. That's good for corporate <laughs> hospitals. What I say is that. Yeah. I, uh, and I, it's a point to argue on this particular matter. The reason I why I'm I telling you is that I know, I know. Well, when you have facilities and when your patients are able to afford, okay, anesthetic presence is absolutely necessary. <laughs> but most of the places, at more than 60 to 70% of the places in India where the upper or lower scopies are being done, it's being done under local sedation. Not local sedation, I should not use that word, local sedation. Sedation. Well, sedation gone by the particular performer. I mean, the scopist yeah. gives the sedation and yeah. does. That's what's but, going on here. Yeah, but if you get into trouble, you had it. So that is the time. <laughs> 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 if, if you get into trouble, call the nearest anesthesiologist is available and put it on his back. I think I'm getting, I'm no, getting, but then uh, that becomes a medical you. legal issue. Okay. Yes. Hello, yes. That's a medical legal issue. If you are it. the scopist and you go into problem, patient collapses, then you call the anesthetist to come and save you. Yeah. Yes. Really, I touch you. My yes. name is dragged into the legal system. You see? So yes. I would be I reluctant mean, to go in. Unless you announce as a code blue, then I'm going to yeah. help out. Yeah. <laughs>
Abhijit, do we? Uh, yes, I know there are some have questions, but session. we have to wind up. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Dr. Murali is actually asking yeah. us to wind up. There are so many nine questions. Yeah. What we about can... the questions that have been asked? Can we do anything? Um, uh, I, I think just want uh, to. If they can be answered by uh, some yes, kind of email, you, you can answer yeah. it by email. email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just answer one it by request. email. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Just yes, one Dr. request Jayashree. before before we hand over the mic yes, yes, to Dr. Yes, Dr. Yes. I just yes, wanted yes. to request the B Bron that this is the right time that you should have some educational uh, this thing classes uh, for these tertiary care centers where these people who are keen to learn and make them the centers of excellence and start these orientation classes because yes, the students yes, yes. would like to know the practical aspect. So this is I my agree, special I request. Special. Thank you, Dr. Murlidhar. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much Thanks for joining yeah. us. Yeah I, I think, grateful. yeah, I would like to, uh, I, I would like to request Professor uh, B. Radhakrishnan, who is the president of the ISA, to sum up the session and uh, and give his and give his blessings to this uh, program. Thank you, Abhijit. My blessing is always there for everybody. <laughs> there is nothing now. Anyway, I am really impressed by the last two hours of lectures. It was excellent, informative, and more than informative, a reformative sort of talks which we had, and we are thankful to the Brown Baxter Group for sponsoring this particular lecture of the day. I'm happy Murali Chakrabarti was able to tell on the medical arrays and how we may be able to rectify. Over the years, we are all looking into this particular direction, but the government of India has not come out with very strong rules or the laws, how these things could be minimized. And the surprising thing is that Dr. Rivedran was telling nearly 134 million advanced events taking place all over the world and nearly 2.6 million deaths from adverse reaction taking place in the world. I am really surprised to hear. It's really startling. Even the pandemic COVID has not taken that much of lives in the last 18 months all over the world. So it is too much. In fact, we have to be really up and do something to prevent all these particular preventable deaths. Because these are all preventable deaths. And probably if you have effective management, we may be able to reduce all these medication arrays. And Beltit was talking on the adverse respiratory reaction. Probably he was not getting enough time to go into the depth of the stock. Thank you, Beltit, for the excellent presentation on the matters. Okay. And Ravindran, you opened the way to know more about the smart pumps, drug library, and safety regulation, and the current laws going internationally, even though we are a little bit ignorant of all these things. One thing which I can say, in India, the clinical practice is almost equivalent to what is happening elsewhere in the world, because whatever being introduced anywhere in the world, in six months' time, that particular procedure is copied. But unfortunately, regarding the protocols or the devices, or say the equipments which are to be used or which are to be condemned are not being followed very well. It may take a different course of action unless very tough arm of the law going to come in and say these things have to be outdated and we should have some sort of a standard international regulations in the practice to be brought in. Anyway, I'm so happy for bringing out all these particular areas and what is for the communication arrays and the communication skill which we have to develop, you made an excellent short presentation. I request on behalf of ICA to make a one-day course on the communication skill, that too, online course. Well, you can write up all these particular things and give it to us. We may be able to publish and we may be able to arrange a one-day course on the communication, one-day online course or say limited hours course online. And if you are prepared, well, we are there to extend our arms to you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. And thank all you. my friends, the moderators were excellent today. They were really incising on every particular area and was watchful about the talks going on. 
and all the friends who are with us today and who are helping us to conduct this particular program, especially Dr. Shailesh, Shailesh, office staff, well, uh, Gupta, and I am thankful to all those people to be with us to sponsor this program and to make us knowledge more about what is happening around the world. And I once again thank you all for being with us for this particular program. And I invite you next week, same time, for the same sort of program on this particular online. And next week program is a different program which is going to be announced very soon. And again, the 14th of July, that's going to be a one-year annual of the webinars and going to be done with a grand function. Probably one of the highlights of the function is a, a quiz which nobody has dared to connect in India, an online quiz with nearly 50 teams. Well, our master presenter, Dr. Sanish, is preparing on this particular matter, and you will be witnessing that particular quiz. And once again, good night to you all, and thank you all very much, and see you all next time at this particular webinar. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you so Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank On behalf of very much. Ron. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. On behalf thank of Ben and Asclap Academy, I thank all of you for your kind time and cooperation. Thank, thank you, Dr. Prince. Dr. Prince. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks all the attendees thank and please provide us with your feedback and poll questions. Thank you. A very good night to all of you. Good night. Right. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Eh? Ethereum, 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 Ethere